الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Jala'il qulub wa anwar al Upon his blessed family and his companions and those who follow them until the end of time Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us to reach another Ramadan We know the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Six months after Ramadan Those six months they would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them for their shortcomings that they acquired during the blessed month. And then those months leading up to Ramadan, they would say, Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, bless us to reach uh, another blessed Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And we know that the Prophet Sallallahu when people would ask him often, ayu a'mal al-afdal, like what's the best thing to do? He said, alayka bi siyam fa inna la nadhira lah. Aw kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa inna hu la adalah. Meaning that you should fast, because fasting, there's nothing comparable to fasting. And we know that fasting is so blessed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّهُ li wa ana adzibi." In Hadith Qudsi, that fasting, every act you do is for something, except fasting is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the season of Rabbaniyyah. This is the season of the people of Allah. This is the season of the hearts that are tied to the Arsh of Allah. This is the season of the Ummah of Khair al-Anam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, this is the season of the Qur'an. As Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Shah Ramadan al-Ladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an, Hudal lil-Nas wa bayyinatim min al-Huda wal-Furqan. That this month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was sent as a means of guidance. And as something which is going to clarify difficulties and hardships. As the Shatibi said, سَوَادَ الدُّجَى حَتَّى تَفَرَّقَ وَانْجَلِي As Imam Shatibi says in Hirz Amani that you know like the, the fog has been cleared by the Qur'an and you can see everything in front of you, MashaAllah. And we know that the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam he said لَا فَقْرَ بَعْدِ الْقُرْآنِ In an authentic hadith he said there's no poverty after someone has been exposed to the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But that comes of course with a tremendous responsibility. Some of our teachers used to say, Ziyadatul Fadail. You know, the more blessings to feed Ziyadatul Mas'uliya means also that it comes with a greater responsibility. And that's why when that person came to Sayyidina Muhammad, وسلم, because to be a servant of God is not to be fashionable. Right? To be a servant of God is to escape the secular paradigm. It's not to find value in what I have, what race I belong to, what tribe I'm from, what language I speak. All this is dunya. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقْ And what's going to last is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why fasting forces us to pull back and distance ourselves from the cult of consumption. To distance ourselves from the kind of constructions that are polluting the hearts of people by coming back to the Qur'an. But that's not fashionable. Like to be a believer is not necessarily going to be a fashionable thing. In a community that's been consistently hit with the uppercuts of Islamophobia has to make sure that it strategically negotiates its entrance into the society that it may be begging for acceptance from. 
So when that man comes to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he says to him, I want to follow you, I love you. And the Prophet says to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, be careful what you say. And he said, no, no, by Allah. And the Prophet said, then prepare for poverty. He didn't mean spiritual poverty. He meant prepare for difficulties and challenges and, and, and adversity. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's why when he was asked, who are the people tested the most? He said, Al-Anbiya Uthumma Salihun. The Prophets and the Righteous. Fatuba lil ghurubah. Islam started as something strange. It will go back to something strange. So Jannah, the highest level of Jannah for those who are strange. We've been reading the Quran over the last few days and on Instagram I've been trying as time permits. My wife is like right at the cusp of launch, alhamdulillah. Make dua for us as well as all those who are experiencing childbirth these days insha'Allah. But one of the things that I tried to do because I was lucky enough, alhamdulillah, to have memorized the Quran a long time ago, is that to look at it as a thematic document, not just as an individual moment. So I just want to share with you some thoughts because the fashionable relationship with the Quran is one that gets lost in virtues or over amplifies the law and loses its spirit. But a deeper relationship with the Quran will create different types of readings of the Quran. That's why Sayyidina Imam Al Ghazali, if we can scoot forward, inshaAllah. Sayyidina Imam Al Ghazali, radiallahu anhu, he said, I have different types of reciting the Quran. He said, One, I finish every three days. One, I finish every week. One, I finish every month. One, I finish every year. He said, And there's one that I will not finish before I die. One time I was in Kuwait years ago when I was memorizing the Quran in al Dahiya, and we called Sheikh Sha'rawi. Those of you who know who is Sheikh Mutawalli Sha'rawi, Allah Yarhamu. And we ask him, you know, the person asked, when do you think you will finish your famous tafsir, the greatest tafsir in the, in the contemporary age? Hands down is the tafsir of Imam Sha'rawi. And he said, I don't think I'll finish it. I'll die before I finish my relationship with the Quran. He said, like, I'm like a person lost in a bahar, like I'm lost in an ocean. And everything is amazing and beautiful. So if we think about the last four or five parts of the Quran, we'll try to get as much done as we can now. There are some powerful messages for a community, a community which we have to begin to frame Islamophobia as the extension of Arab and non-Arab dictatorships into the West. They are funded by these people. So the attempt to condition our public practice of Islam by intimidation. We see our Imam, Imam Omar Suleiman. What other person would go to the Congress and lead a prayer and be accused of not being American enough? What does it tell you? So we should not allow Islamophobia to intimidate us. We should be bold and we should be strong. And we should remind them that you're in bed with the fara'ina of this age. You're in bed with those mass murderers and killers, yet you claim to be people who love freedom. So it's important that our relationship with the Quran is one that helps us recalibrate our strength in the front of serious ex in front of serious existential threats. Allah says, "Nuthabitu bifuadak." The Quran was sent to strengthen you, to make you strong. Inna sunuqi alika qawlan thaqila. You're not a weak community. We sent you a strong speech. Zayd Mithabit said, when the Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, I saw his camel sit down from the weight of the Qur'an. لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَلْ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَّةِ اللَّهِ Even the mountain couldn't handle the Qur'an, but you as a believer, your heart is stronger than a mountain, subhanAllah. So we open the Qur'an, the first part of the Qur'an does something extremely important. It gives us the foundations of our religion, usul al-deen. Belief in Allah, belief in prophets, belief in the hereafter, belief in sacred liturgy, belief in dua. And the sixth, it teaches us that in our relationship with truth, we're going to fall into one of three categories. Those who know and those who act, anamta alayhim. Those who know and don't act, maghdubi alayhim. They earned wrath. Those who don't know and try to act, adhalin. And that's it, subhanAllah. 
That's why Al Hassan al Basri, he said, Allah sent hundreds of books. And he summarized those books in four the Torah, the Torah, the Injil, the Psalms, the Zabur, and the Quran. And he said he summarized those four from the 49th chapter of the Quran to Nas al Mufassal. And he summarized that in Al Fatiha. And he summarized all of that in Iyaka and Abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. So this is like a powerful chapter, man. It's the sight map to Akhirah. It's the sight map to escape the trickery and confusion of a world which is really traumatized by irresponsible leadership. But the end of that chapter lays out that relationship. And then we go to Surah Al-Baqarah. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, it took him 12 years to finish Surah Al-Baqarah. SubhanAllah, 12 years. And he used to say in Surah Al-Baqarah is 1,000 commands and 1,000 prohibitions and 1,000 lessons. And Surah Al-Baqarah introduces us to the foundations of our religion. The practices are sacred practices, prayer, charity. And they believe in the sunnah, what was sent to Sayyidina Muhammad and what came before you, other prophets, the foundations of Iman. And then it introduces us to people. The first are disbelievers, those who reject. And the second are those who are amongst us. We ask Allah to protect us, but they are hypocrites. Those who say we believe, but they don't believe. And we go through, subhanAllah, the first part of the Qur'an, this continues to play out. What are the things which are going to take you from Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path, and what can you do to remedy it? So, hypocrites, those who are your enemies. And then, a short time later, we're introduced to the devil, through the story of our father, Sayyidina Adam. With qala rabbuka lil malaikati inni ja'ilu fil ardi khalifa. And Allah says about him, فَأَزَّلَهُمُ shaytan. There's a different qira'ah. فَأَزَّلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا Meaning that shaytan forced him to slip. And what did he use in the age of Islamophobia? We go to Sultan A'raf in the attempt. No religion is being publicly conditioned with prayer, head and shoulders. You name it. We all up in the beauty salon getting straightened out by Islamophobia. Or getting a perm. Or whatever we want to get our fades on. All of us are subjected to it because to be a Muslim in America is to be in a state of constantly editing yourself. We have to be honest about that fear and then we have to emancipate ourselves from that fear. And we find that in the story of the prophets. So what happens? Shaitan uses in Surah Araf the dominant message. For example, white supremacy, whatever's out there that can be used to create challenges and problems. Peer pressure. He doesn't say, I'm an I'm an advisor. He said, it's a lot of people that want to tell you this about the tree, but I'm the one who loves you the most. I got your back. And then he swears. Ibn Qayyim says, the first example of false advertisement in history is Satan with Adam. The only reason your Lord told you not to eat from the tree is because You're going to become an angel, man. You're going to live forever. Every single day, we get this message from different sources in our lives. You're going to live forever. Remember when I was little, my mother would take me to buy shoes. I was like, do these shoes make me faster? She's like, son, we need to talk. <laughs> right? Because it's easy to get caught up, man. But then Allah gives us a way to protect ourselves and stay on Surat al Mustaqim. Which means the words of Toba came to Adam. They were ordered in a different narration of the Quran that we read from, from the seven. The words of Toba walked to Adam and said, Allah has ordered me to come to you. Some said the first thing that Adam learned of the Asma 
was how to make repentance, how to turn to Allah. So we're, learn, we, we, we're taught how to heal the mistakes we may make as maghdubi alayhim, as a dalim, with the remedy of tawbah. And then the first chapter, first part of the Quran, goes into communities who slipped and failed for a number of reasons. Number one, they allowed the physical paradigms and constructions of life to reject prophethood. So life wasn't measured through prophethood, prophethood is measured through life. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تَذْبَحُوا بَقَرَةً Allah has ordered you to slaughter, slaughter a cow. What about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? What about this? فَذَبَحُوهُ وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ They did it, but they did it begrudgingly. The other thing that we find communities challenged with outside of accepting the dominant constructions around them to interpret their religion instead of allowing their religion to guide them and lead them is a disease of the heart. They had a problem. They said, our hearts are sealed. Their hearts became hard. The third, they fell for the okidok. I don't know how else to say it. They fell for Harry Potter, man. Sihr. Magic. One day I was walking down the street. This lady said, I can read your palm. I said, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim." Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. She's like, "Now, nah, your people, I can't mess with you." I said, "I can read with you, though." I did it nicely, like I did, you know, nice bass boost voice, not the scary voice. What tabu ma tatlu shayatino ala mulki Sulaiman, wa ma kafara Sulaiman. Allah mentions us the story. That's how we should understand this. What are the challenges to staying on Siratul Mustaqim? And then the end of the first part of the Quran introduces us to something very important. Redemptive history. History has the power to teach us and protect us and guide us. But history also has the power to heal us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the first juz all of the problems that you may face on Siratul Mustaqim, all of the challenges that you may incur, don't forget who your father is. As though it's saying like, don't worry, all of the challenges that you're going to face, don't lose your identity, don't lose that spiritual DNA that takes you back to Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبَلُ To ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us engage in a broader, more challenging engagement with his book. As Shah Tabi says, وَجَاهِدْ بِهِ حِبَّ الْعِدَى مُتَحَبِّلًا You know, make jihad on yourself to, to study the Qur'an. Force yourself and discipline yourself, he says to us, to engage in an intimate relationship with the book of Allah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yuhabib ilayna kitaba. Ask Allah to make his bulag beloved to us. Aqulu qawri hadha. Astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiru. Innahu ghafur rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyid al-awwalin wa al-akhirin. Sayyidina wa habibina Muhammadin. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the first part of the Quran ends, and it ends with this notion of redemptive history, going back to our spiritual identity, tying ourselves to our father Sayyidina Ibrahim. And we see also the idea of generational spirituality. مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي Yaqub as he's dying, he says to his kids like, what are you going to worship after I'm gone? Jacob says, what are you going to worship when I'm gone? And then that takes us to the second part of the Qur'an where we're introduced to people that are going to be agitators. If we're not on the truth, we won't find agitators. That's just how it is. Allah says in Surah An'am, every prophet had enemies. And what happens? سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مَا وَلَّاهُمْ عَنْ قِبَلَتِهِمُ الَّتِي كَانُوا عَلَيْهَا 
What's this deal with you changing the Qibla? You know, in the Qibla, the direction of prayer was changed. It was like Isra Mi'raj. They say Isra Dunya, you know, the impact of the Isra in As Sama. Many people, when the Isra happened in the heavens, people left Islam. Also, when the Qibla was changed, people left Islam. Like it wasn't easy. Ma wallahum, like what has caused you there to turn away from the right way? Peer pressure. And they continued to chastise the fledgling community of the Prophet in the beginning of the second chapter of the Quran. But the second chapter lays out some things we should think about as a community as we deal with people trying to shape our image. Again, very pertinent to where we are now. And the first thing that the Quran says to take on that pressure publicly, the first place to turn. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu sta'inu bis sabri was salah O believers seek Allah's help with fasting sabr and prayer And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again touches on the idea of redemptive history in as safa wal marwa min sha'iri Allah Allah didn't say you know hajj this this he mentioned safa and marwa and we're reminded of a brilliant black woman of color who because of her how many incredible women in our history were women of color yet how do we treat people of color in our own community how do we engage others we have again adopted the dominant secular paradigm on race hence if you look at people's marriage accounts a brother showed me a few days ago he's on Minder that someone wrote I'll talk to you for earbuds I said, La hawla wa la quwata illa Summun bukmun ummun yani. I saw others he showed me. I said, Subhanallah, people turn into this into like a come up, man. Like this is a way to like barter your life. If we see the descriptions of what we're looking for in marriage, it's okay to marry what you love and are attracted to. Don't get me wrong. But is it realistic or is it fed by the dominant secular consumer paradigm? Our community is resting on the acts of great black women. That's undeniable. My teacher who taught me the qiraat was taught by his sister in Senegal. 14 qiraat. Not his father, not his brother. Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, one of the greatest scholars of hadith. His sister, an Egyptian woman. He said, my sister lived in poverty and refused to sell my father's books so I could become a scholar. And he made dua for her in his writings. What happened to us? We got turned out. Turned out by Frank. Turned out by that dominant narrative. So what should we do as a sense of healing? Turn back to salah, turn back to worship, turn back to our history. Inna safa wal marwata min sha'ir Allah. These are signs of God. The third thing that this part of the Quran encourages us to do to survive the onslaught of the extensions of dictatorships, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions very beautifully. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa khtila fi layli wa nahar wal fulki allati tajiri fi al bahr. Allah mentions all the signs in this world to see. It's like you're watching planet Earth in this verse, man. As if to say, think about the creation around you. Take some time to contemplate. Let that lead you. And that takes us to fasting and takes us to other acts. And that leads us to the third part of the Quran and we'll finish here because of time. And as you read the Quran, you should take thematic notes, you know, try to find those relationships that are there. My review this year is not that good because, you know, I'm on the launch pad, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm the guy ordering hamburgers at 3 o'clock in the morning. So my review is like on the go, alhamdulillah. But the third part of the Quran after talking about how to be careful of falling astray, how to repair in the first part of the Qur'an, then announcing us as a 
collective, a critical mass, and the second part of the Qur'an is going to face critical opposition, how to take on that critical opposition through community, through unity, through loving each other, through acts of worship like prayer, hajj, fasting, da'wah. The third part of the Qur'an does something else. It challenges us to marry those acts with etiquette. And etiquette is not easy. أَقْرَبُكُمْ إِلَيَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَحْسَنُكُمْ خُلُقًا those of you close to me in the hereafter are the best in character. It's not easy. So Allah says, Tilka Rusuru Faddalna Ba'dahum ala ba'd. Because as we're out in the streets going at it, for example, with other communities, we may inadvertently insult one of their prophets or think, yeah, this or that. Allah says, listen, they're all noble prophets. Some we favored over others, but we believe in all of them. Don't insult what other people worship. So the Qur'an ties our religiosity to the nuance and temperament needed to engage the public sphere. We don't insult people's gods. We don't insult people's prophets. So we may be zealous religiously, but we have to temper that zealousness with akhlaq. La ikraha fi din After Ayatul Kursi. Why? Because when you read Ayatul Kursi, you're like, yo, I'm ready to go. Allahu Akbar, Ayatul Kursi. Next verse, there's no compulsion in religion. Stay cool. And the next da'wah, look at Sayyidina Ibrahim. Alam tara ila ladhi haja Ibrahim fi rabbi. Did you not see the one that Ibrahim argued with? Qala an uhi wa umid. He said, I cause life and death. Can you imagine if someone put on Facebook now, I cause life and death, hashtag Ramadan 2019. <laughs> that person would be banned from every social media outlet in the dunya and the akhirah. But what does Ibrahim do? He doesn't argue with him. He's passionate. He's in da'wah. But he knows that da'iya is a representative of Allah. And the representative of God has to have character. So he doesn't argue. He says, okay, fine. If you can cause life and death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the sun to rise from the east. Can you cause it to rise from the west? Mashal hal, fabuhita alladhi kafar. He doesn't get into it with him. He doesn't have to get nasty. He keeps nuanced, as Mutanabi said. I don't know how to translate Mutanabi in English, but the meaning is to think before you're brave is two braveries. So we see the da'wah and the nuance. And then we see, subhanAllah, in giving charity, Allah said, give, but don't give to hurt people. Give, but don't give to expect something back. So the second part of the Qur'an now begins to build not only if the second part of the Qur'an, excuse me, built our external practices, the third part of the Qur'an ties that to internal etiquette. And that would take us to the fourth. And the theme of the fourth, you have to watch on the gram. But the fourth is about the battle of the material and the spiritual. How someone without a husband can have a baby. How many times did a small group defeat a larger group? So that's, inshallah, some lessons we can take from the first parts of the Qur'an that we read, mashallah, over this week. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love us. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, with His transcendent mercy and grace, forgive us for the deliberate mistakes that we made. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from having ill thoughts of other people. We ask Allah to help those who may be the objects of abuse, mental, physical, or social abuse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us your allies. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove those difficulties and give you a way out. We ask Allah to protect our marriages, to protect our children. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect and bless all of our amazing students who have finals. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these finals easy for you, inshallah. Ask Allah to bless our brother Imam Khalid and his wonderful wife Priya and their children Kareem and Medina. MashaAllah, they've given so much to our community. To our brother Sheikh Fayaz, his wonderful wife and their children. To our awesome staff, Sister Amira, MashaAllah. Sister Aziza, Sister Hana, Brother Ridwan, MashaAllah, and all of the wonderful volunteers. Ask Allah to bless all of you, inshaAllah. 
Brothers and sisters, mashallah, as you know, we have like these really amazing iftars here, like, like five-star gulab jamans, you know, like incredible, incredible matluba, you know, even halal hamburgers for those of us who are converts, alhamdulillah. But those things don't just fall from the heavens. Like, it didn't just fall from the sky, you know? So it's around $5,500 a night to feed us, subhanAllah. So inshallah, we need people to generously donate, inshallah, and support the efforts of the IC. As one young lady came to me who said, it's been years since I've been plugged into the Muslim community. Like I abandoned the Muslim community because they abandoned me. But I found the connection here. So it's not only that we're trying to feed stomachs, we want to feed hearts. We want to help people engage in like healing and coming back because that's a way to come back to Allah. So we ask you inshallah to generate, uh, to donate generously inshallah. رَبَّنَا أَتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدِ ذَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُونَكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَالسَّلَامُونَ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَ